Okay. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I want to thank the organizer also for, for this event. I'm really honored to be here. I'm going to talk also about uh, completion problems, but I'm going to talk about a different flavor of completion problems when you have interval data. So the situation, an example might look something like this. You have some unknown distance. Some of the distance are given in terms of intervals, and some of the distance are precisely defined. And where you can find a situation like this? Our motivation is the intramolecular distance estimation in NMR spectroscopy. I'm not an expert on that, but this is a cartoonish representation of the situation. You have some atoms in a molecule that have some magnetic properties, and somehow you're able to affect this, this magnetic uh, properties, and you are able to measure the interference. And this measurement is, depends on the distance. If the atoms are too close, you're able to actually measure these things. But if the atoms are too far apart, you're not able to have this measurement. But what you are measuring is a, a peak in this interference. So what you end is a, an, you end with a, an interval for some estimation, one estima an interval estimation for some of the distance. Some of the distance, you don't know anything about it, and some are more precisely defined. And we want to complete this matrix. We'd want, we would like to complete this matrix. And what it means, what means to complete a matrix in this situation? Well, a possibility is trying to, fi is trying to find specific values for the distance. So you have a matrix satisfy satisfying these interval constraints. This can be uh, achieved with some of the, the optimization methods you talk about, the Professor Alfaki talked about, and adding a constraint to, to find a, a, a distance satisfying, satisfying this interval constraint. But we are more interested in, in a different kind of completion of this matrix. We would like to know what are the possible values for this entrance? What, are, what is the set of values of this distance? So in this setting, we are going to end with a matrix with set-valued entrance. At the end, we don't have set-valued entrance. This is what we would like to achieve. But we are going to consider a very specific class of completion matrix because we're going to have to, we're going to take use of the specific structure on the matrix. And this is the, the example of how, the, the kind of problems that we are considering. In these problems, this ball, distance are the unknown distance. And the kind of problem where we are going to deal with is problem in that you are able to separate this, separate this unknown distance in an upper and lower part of the matrix. And all this center band is, is from intervals or precisely no intervals. So what we are assuming is that there is a, a number row here such that the if the difference between index is less than this value, the distance are known, given as numbers or intervals. If the difference between index is bigger than this number, you don't know anything about this. This is an strong assumption because uh, to deal with real data, you, you, should, you should do some pre-processing pre -processing to, to have this. But we are going to assume that this is the situation, that we actually have this. And in fact, because we are trying to, to solve problems related to molecular conformation, we are, interest, we are interested in three-dimensional realizations. We are looking for distant values corresponding to three-dimensional realizations. This is what we call the molecular Euclid and distant matrix completion problem. This is the kind of problem that we would like to solve. Complete this matrix, find the possible values for this distance regarding to three-dimensional realizations. Uh, there, is a uh, there is a special problem when you take this row equal to n minus 1, and this is when there is only one value missing. There is only, prob there is only value missing. We call this a D1 in completion problem. But, and and why, why, why we want to solve this in this context? Why is this important to solve this in this context? Because it's a, it's a really trivial observation that if you are able to solve any kind of this D1N problem, then you can solve small pieces of this bigger completion problem. You can solve, for example, try to obtain a set, uh, a solution for this problem using this matrix, the same with this matrix, and again with this matrix. So at the end of this first step, you end with three estimation for this part of the, 
of the matrix. And you can do the same with this, with this, and so on. So that is why it is important to solve this D1N completion problem. In fact, okay, well, so I, what I'm going to focus now on this kind of problem, when there is one missing problem, one missing entrance problem. And in fact, Professor Alfaki already uh, worked on this, on, this, on this problem in this recent book. It's the one missing entry completion problem. Uh, he con uh, considering precise data. I'm going to talk first about what happened when you have precise data, how to solve this problem with precise data. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you, this is really things that Professor Alpha Key already talked about. This equivalence between distant matrix and positive semi-definite matrix. Here, note that I'm not using, for, for, he, for me, this D is the distance, and the square distance is the D hat. So the, that's what I'm using this correspond to, okay? But it's the same result. The, the, the vector of all ones that are Professor Alfaki already said is talk about. You have these results, and you have this more general result when you can take another vector to give this equivalence between distant matrix and positive semi-definite matrix. So we are going to use this result, but with a specific uh, vector, the first, canonic, the first element of the canonical base. And this is how it looks, the, the matrix. This is how the matrix looks. And in this case, the thing is that you can obtain a block matrix when you apply this to the, to the, to the, to the square distance matrix. Here I, I take the half, because this is not going to change the semi-definite positive thing. So I'm, gonna take, I, I'm not using the half here. So when you apply this to a square distance matrix, you obtain a block matrix, something like this. You see that the unknown value is here, but it's also here in this y vector. Let me show you an example of what it looks like. This is the, this is the, the matrix LDL, L transpose DL. This is how it looks like. Now that this first part is all known, and this is where the unknown value is, this ball value here. This is the X matrix. Here. And one observation is that this matrix, this matrix must be positive semi-definite. Because this is the, this is the grand matrix, this, twice the grand matrix for the known data. This is the same multiplication, minus L, D, for the known part of the data. So this is positive semi-definite. This is the vector Y, this is Y transpose. So the question is, can we find condition on this value in order to this matrix to be positive semi-definite? Because this will be the solution of this completion problem. In fact, there is some results about positive semi-definite of block matrix. This is a result. Here is the generalized Schurz complement involved. So when you use these results on this specific matrix, you obtain some, something like this. This matrix, the correspond to an Euclidean distant matrix if you have all these three conditions. The first we already discussed that must be satisfied is you are, if you are using uh, actual distance and you have all these, these two different conditions. Note that this three condition is a real inequality because the only thing unknown here is this value. This is a real number. This is a real number. Here is inside this is also this real number. Okay, so let's take a, look, a closer look to what is this vector y and in order to understand better what, is, what are these conditions. In the example I show you, this is the vector y. Now that I can rewrite this vector, if I call this a known value as omega, I can rewrite this vector y as a y as omega times a constant vector, and this is data also, this is unknown. So you have a situation like this. And this condition, for example, that is in the theorem became something like this. This is a vector, this is a vector, this is omega. And most of the time, these vectors are going to be zero because most of the time this, this matrix X um, has <coughs> no in the linearly independent rows, so this is gonna be the identity most of the time. But if not, this is a, this is a, a vector, okay. The other condition that there was there, the other term that was in the theorem was something like this. When you use this equality with y, it became something like this. 
So you have this, this is a polynomial in the omega variable. This is a constant, a constant here. And in fact, this constant is positive because the pseudo inverse of a positive semi-definite matrix is also positive semi-definite. This C is also positive semi-definite, so you have a polynomial here. Okay, so doing that, passing to, to omega, you have a, this, this theorem. The thing that you're looking for, a solution, must satisfy this. And most of the time, this is going to be obviously satisfied because this is zero most of the time, but if not, you need a constant that satisfies this, and you need to, this polynomial inequality. You need to satisfy this polynomial inequality. But this is a positive constant. This is also a positive constant. So the only situation where this happens is that omega is between the roots, between the roots of this polynomial. So in fact, when you give the, use this R1 or R2 as the solution of these quadratic equations, here I just put this 2 D1N, 2 omega to the other side. This is what's happening here. Uh, you have this result. Let's call this bracket D1N the set of possible completion values for, uh, uh, for the D1 completion problem. If these, real, uh, these roots are not negative real numbers and all these things are zero, then the, this possible interval of a solution is, has to be the roots of this, the square roots of these values. If uh, this vector is not the vector zero, then in order for omega to satisfy this equality, it, it must be this. There's only one possibility. You have to take the non-zero introns here and divide it, put it to divide here to obtain the only possible value. So there is only one possible value in this case. There is only one possible. And this empty is, uh, the set is empty otherwise. In the approach of Professor Alpha Key, he, he considered uh, an additional hypothesis because I'm using only the upper part of the matrix. With this other condition, you don't have this case. <coughs> There's always uh, a solution. But. Okay, so now we have solved the problem of when, when there is one missing entrance, how to complete the matrix. This is what, this is what we already solved. But remember that we are looking for a specific dimension. We want to do that in three dimensions. So how to choose between these values, which one correspond to a specific dimension? That is what, what we would like to, to do. Well, remember that this result already gives us, uh, I think, uh, uh, some, some information about the embedding dimension. The rank of this matrix is the embedding dimension. So now we want to, to solve these kind of questions. How the values in this solution set affect the rank of this? What is the rank of this matrix? And unfortunately, we have a result about rank of block matrix. Fortunately, we have a result about that. Uh, the rank of a block matrix can be given by something like this. When this is satisfied, this is the, the range of a matrix. So if the the range of this matrix is contained on the range of this matrix and so on, you can obtain this, this relationship. And when you translate this to our matrix, we obtain this result. The rank of this matrix is going to be the rank of X plus the rank of this. Note that, of course, when this, when this, is the, when this happens, when this, this is satisfied, if this is satisfied, you obtain this, this relationship. But this is already, this can be, this is satisfied in our context because remember the first theorem, the, the, the theorem that we were using, know that because, know that if we obtain a, a value corresponding to an uh, Euclidean distance matrix, this condition is satisfied. So in fact, the space generated by Y is uh, containing the space generated by X. So we have this condition. So we obtain this result. If this is a value that completes the matrix in order to become a, an EDM, then the rank of this matrix must be equal to this. And we remember this already, we already discussed what is the, the, what is the shape of this expression. So we end up with a result like this. And in fact, we already said that this is twice the grand matrix of the known data. So this is the, the given embedding dimension. This is the embedding dimension of the known data. 
So what we are saying here is that when, completion, when complete the value, when, complete, when, when you take a value to complete the matrix, you cannot, increase, you cannot decrease the rank, this is obvious. You cannot decrease the embedding dimension. But here, this is a real number, so this, is, this rank is gonna be zero or one. So you are going to preserve the dimension or to increase the dimension by one, of course. But more important is that the only values that are, that are going to preserve the dimension are the roots of this polynomial. So the roots of this polynomial are the only values that we already saw that these values are in the extreme of this interval. And these are the only possible values to preserve the dimension. So we have uh, an interesting result combining this situation. The result is like this. If this solution, if this solution set is not empty, you have a solution, then the values here corresponding to a realization of minimal embedding dimension must be extreme points of this interval. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, we are here just in the precise case. Okay. We're gonna go now to the, to the interval case. So for precise data, for precise data, the, the point of minimal embedding dimension must be extreme points of these solution sets. Okay, so let's go back to uh, interval data, okay? So this is the situation, and this is an example of the kind of situation. And let me represent this kind of situation with some notation like this. this. This is interval data. We can use this as an x variable with different, with entrances x1, x2, x3, 4, and any of, each of these entrants belonging to a, an interval. So you can represent this, this interval data as a matrix with a x varying in an interval set, in a set. This is a, a set, it's not an interval, it's just a, a set in some space. This is a more general situation here. And when you consider this situation with these this x values varying on an interval or in a set, you can think in different completion values, different completion sets. For example, you can consider for a given x, if you give me one x fixed, you can try to solve the, com the, the completion problem. For a given x, you have precise data how to solve this problem. Consider that this corresponding to any domain. But the kind of solution that we are looking for is obtain all the possible values for some of the x. We would like to know, to let the x vary about this set. And in fact, we're looking for a specific dimension. Here I put it in k dimension, but we're looking for a specific dimension. In fact, in most of the cases, we're looking for minimal embedding dimension because we are supposed, supposing that, we are assuming that the data is from three dimension for dimension three, and we want to obtain values preserving this dimension, the minimal dimension. So we are looking for this with k minimal. And if you try, we are going to try to attack this problem with minimal k. So the, the theorem that we saw before, it will be translated in something like this. For each x, if you take a fixed value, and if the solution set is not empty, then this, uh, value, one of the values on this interval correspond to a minimal embedding dimension only if and only is an extreme point. So let's try to, to write this interval in a different way. For each x, you can find an interval, and the extremes of this interval is gonna give you the values of minimal embedding dimension. The extreme, this is a really interesting result. The extreme values. So these functions L and U are gonna give you the minimal embedding dimension. Let me show you an ugly picture here of the idea of what is happening. If this is I of your unprecise set and you take one X, you, com you compute this interval. The extreme of this, va of, this ex of this interval are the points of minimal embedding dimension. This is all happening in, in, in this non-negative uh, real numbers. And imagine now that you let vary x across this imprecise uh, about and, and on this set i. What you're going to obtain is that these extreme values are going to vary also something like this or something like this. Of course, 
because this is this this this, con this function is not continued, no, it's not necessarily continuous. Uh, it might happen that suddenly this jump over here, but this is the general idea. Okay, so the th the set that we're looking for are precisely the image of these functions over this set. This is what we're looking for. So actually, the situation is like this. No, no. Let me see if I, I get understand the question. This for a fixed x, these two values correspond to the same minimal dimension, to the minimal same dimension. Minimal. Yeah, but there's the possibility of moving l and d cooperatively. So let's say you make l larger, a larger deviation, and d a smaller deviation, and you find the same embedding, minimal embedding dimension. There's no proof that this is a unique set. Mm. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. If this is such a unique set, you said that? The extremal values L and D are unique. That's the question. The extreme values are unique. The values of the function, well, I guess it is it's <coughs> unique because the result of that is that the, is that if it, it, this point if you have a minimal dimension, a point of minimal embedding dimension, it must be one of these two values. It has to be one of these two values. It has to be. I guess I probably we can discuss this yeah. later. Okay, so we are trying to, to obtain this set, the image of this set i by the function i and by the function l, the fun excuse me, this is l and u. And one way to try to estimate this is to obtain the maximal and minimal values of these functions on this set i. So that's one way to, to try to do it. So let's call L min, L max, U min, U max, the optimal values of this. And what we have is that the following result. This set of minimal embedding dimension has to be contained in this union, okay? has to be contained in this union. And if you add additional, additional uh, hypothesis, these extreme values are, all, are also contained here. It might happen that, what we're, that when you consider the max value of, of L and the mean value of L, of L you, might, you might lose something because maybe this function is not continuous, so maybe it's gonna jump, but at least you have a, an estimation like this. This set that you're looking for is contained this, and these values must also be contained in this set. So this is the base, this is our main result, and this is why we propose to use this as an estimation of this value. So you see that you can obtain, an esti for estimation of this distance, you can obtain a, a union of intervals. Let me show you uh, how this looks like. In a, this is an artificial example, this is not a real example, artificial, but just to give you a, a, an idea of how this looks like. Imagine that you want to complete this matrix, and you know you have an, an interval for this distance and this distance. This is this, the interval that you have. So the optimal values here are computed. Uh, we compute these values. We, we use here a really naive approach. We just use the global optimization uh, tool in Octavia, this is really naive. So with this, we have an estimation of this set, of this distance D15 as this uniform interval. This is the, the situation, okay? Let me show you a bigger example here with more data. This is more close to a molecular completion problem at most data. So there are three unknown values. And now we're gonna use this idea that you explained before. We're gonna try to estimate D15, later 2, 6, and with that, we're gonna try to estimate D16. This is what we're gonna try to do. So the first part is the previous example, so we already know this, we already have this estimation. And we can do something similar for this D26. 
this is the situation. So now you have intervals estimation for these unknown values. So now we can try to go to the other, to the other uh, situation, but to the other estimation. But now, know that the constraint here is, uh, is not connect. <coughs> the constraint here is not connected. We had, you had two intervals that are not connected. So in fact, this is, a, this is a difficulty in the optimization, in the implementation of this. But we can obtain, using the same idea, maximizing L, minimizing L, we can obtain this, this interval. Let me show you, this is the final uh, estimation of this, of this value, D16, but let me show you how you can achieve this by taking, for example, X4 in one interval and X5 in other interval and having this different kind of estimation. So if you take X4 in one, on the, in, in one of the interval and X5 in the other interval, you're gonna obtain D16 like this. So in fact, you obtain the same, a single interval. If you change the interval for X5, you obtain another interval estimation from D16, and so on, and so on. When you consider these sets and the overlapping in between, the, between, them, between them, you obtain that, you obtain this interval. So this is the general idea, this is the idea that I wanted to show you, that we're using these properties of, of extreme values related to minimal embedding dimension, you can obtain this kind of result. Another thing that is interesting here is look that with this idea, you can use new information to improve your, previously, your previous estimation. Imagine, for example, that somehow for another experiment, you know that D16 is in the interval 5.9 to 6.1. Imagine that somehow you know that Another, you obtain another estimation of this D16, 5.9 to 6.1. Well, immediately you are going to reject all these intervals. So now you have a better estimation of X4 and X5 because it has to be only this one. So using the information, new information for D16, you are able to, to improve your previous estimation of X4 and X5. But for example, imagine that somehow you now that D16 in another experiment is equal to six, or yeah, equal to five, for example. Imagine that in one well, new experiment tell you that D16 is exactly equal to five. So you cannot reject anything here, right? But you could, you could try to go back, put this as five, reorganize your points, and try to do new estimation using this as new data here. Okay. So the main contribution of this work is the theoretical development that allows to estimate this value, this interval, with minimal k, and the use of this, the results in, a, in this class of completion problems. Uh, as I discussed just before, these results can also be used to improve estimations when new distant values are available. One of the problems here, of course, is if there is a way to improve the optimization techniques because we are, I'm using a really naive approach. It is a black box optimization. This, is, this function are really expensive to compute. In the middle, if I, for every x, if I want to compute these values, I have to compute a pseudo inverse. So this, this might be expensive. And also the set, when you start going to op, op, upper levels, this set is not connected because you, might have, you are having different, separal, separ different uh, estimations. So this is something that there is a lot of things to do to try to do to, to here, but okay. Well, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> it was fast. <laughs> Question. It was too fast. <laughs> Yeah, the pre-processing is, it should be a really a uh, big part. Because uh, I'm not working with the real data yet, but of course you need to, to do some pre-processing. This is, this is something that is it's a hard, it's a hard part.
in fact, you don't need to pull anything in the corners. You need like a band that is at least as large as the number of dimensions yeah, of yeah. your realization. Yeah, you're plus right. Three. You're right. You're right. Or maybe plus one. I don't know. Maybe plus one. I don't know. But but this is what this is the real requirement. Then if you have other known data in the corners, that's it doesn't matter. And, and there's, there's heuristics, I forget the names of these, but there's heuristics to reduce the, the, to find permutations of your data, of your matrix, rows and columns, so that you're trying to squeeze it into a narrow band. So that, that may help as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for the preprocessing, all this. To preprocess it, uh, yeah. combined with uh, Leo's idea. I mean, this is, this is really, I, I see this as a branch and prune run on yeah, the matrix yeah. in a sense, right? It, it's a is dual that, branch that, and prune that we imagined a long time ago. And, uh, but of course he does something more because it's kind of got intervals in, inside yeah. the band, so. Other questions? <clears throat> no, so let's take it. Thank you. Thank you.